legit. Like that thing actually makes yes. sense now. Milkshakes and cinnamon pastries on the weekends here, nice. and we do weddings inside the building. So grab a seat and let's uh, make ourselves comfortable. I got a fake cow, and there, there's a donkey behind the thing there. We do a lot of kids' parties, so we're trying to entertain everybody and do stuff. We started in New York when, when my dad was a little boy. He was a hobbyist. I mean, he loved tropical fish. This is when the hobby was brand new. So uh, he, t he, he told me a couple of stories that I want to share with you. One of them was he was raising albino paradise fish, and they lived in the bottom apartment. There was an apartment above them in New York, and he sold some to the little boy upstairs. His mother didn't want him, threw him out the window. And my dad went and picked him back up, put him back in the tank, and sold him to somebody else. So being in New York, and my dad was in the silk screen business. Actually, he, he made this design. He was an artist. In the silk screen business, he had like, I don't know how many, 20, 30 people working for him in New York. It was big time business. Tropical fish was his hobby. He re actually rented the apartment next to where my mother and him lived originally and had nothing but fish tanks in it. And he would tell me stories about a pet shop in New York that, uh, and you gotta realize all these new colors are just brand new stuff. That back in the old days, there was no such thing as a black molly. There was no such thing as a velvet sword. It was all common stuff. The fancy guppy didn't exist back then. And he remembers when the first Black Molly came out, they all headed down to this pet store and got in line. It was almost like a welfare line, he tells me. There was a four-legged bathtub in there because they didn't have all the tanks and fancy stuff, plexiglass, no nothing like that was around. And people would line up just to go in there and take a peek at those Black Mollies. And then they would wait their turn and then they'd go out and the next person would come in line. And that was the beginning of the tropical fish hobby. And my dad has a collection of magazines that go back to 1920 with one of the original things. Actually, I'm going to put them all on the internet and sell them. So 1950, dad says we had enough of this cold weather. He sold his business. We headed to Miami. We found a location, 10 acres on North Kendall Drive. In the heyday, there were probably going to be 30 fish farms in Dade County. All of them sold out. And, uh, cashed into the apartments and all that other stuff. My dad was the only one that stayed down here out of all those old farmers and uh, rebuilt. The deal was we had six months to move. My dad had a building with over 110 gallon tanks. He loved color and he wanted to breed pure, pure color. And, and I'm going to talk a little bit, I'm going to show you a couple things here. Let's take for example, guppies. And I'll tell you about this magazine later on. Guppies, platies, sword tails are mostly like native of Mexico. There are some, some of them that are here in the canals, or used to be in the canals. And Central and South America had them. The original common guppy was more like this. Some of them had a little more green and a little bit of red. There was a gentleman down here named Sternkey. Now I'm 75, I remember all these old guys. I'd go around with my dad at 10, 11 years old. So I remember going to Sternkey's and he kept inbreeding. He was like my dad. He had tanks. You, what you would do is you'd breed the guppy with the best looking male you had. Then you would take the adults out and you'd leave the babies in there and you'd watch them over a period of time. And when the males start developing, you get rid of those males or put them in another tank because you want the virgin females. And you're going to breed the virgin females back to the most colorful male you had. And they kept doing this and doing this and eventually they, they developed different strains. That happened to be a green guppy. Now, if you look in today's market, there are so many different kinds of guppies and colors that my dad could never imagine them. And not only did it work with guppies, but it worked with other fish. The original swordtail from Mexico was more like a green swordtail, but it didn't have this real, real red bar, and they were little runted fish. So somebody found some that had red, and then they bred them, and then they got a little more red, and eventually they developed all these other colors by selective breeding. Okay, and, uh, and now there's high fins, there's liar tails, there's all kinds of variations of sword tails. Platys were like a, a greenish color out of, out of Mexico again. They eventually bred all the different colors. Okay, and there's more colors today and you got the high fin liar, the old milk and ink platy. Nobody breeds it anymore. Uh, I have uh, pictures of uh, bleeding heart platys, 
nobody really breeds it anymore because it's not commercial. You get little runt males and big females and only the males have the color. But my dad took the wag platy and he would interbreed them and eventually he got the black to go all the way up the body and we named it the, uh, this, this one happens to be the gold jet platy and he did the red jet and the gold jet platy and he started writing at that point and he wrote for the Trader Magazine which was the magazine for the tropical fish farms in here in South Florida. He wrote for uh, the Aquarium which was an old magazine, I don't know if anybody ever heard of it and then he would write for the TFH magazine, the Tropical Fish Obvious. Herb Axelrod was a, the man that owned the company at that time. And whenever my dad would come out with a new strain or new color variety, uh, he would write an article and send it in and with pictures and they would, they would post it in the magazine. So we left Kendall Drive in 1950. We bought this property, I mean, excuse me, 1969. We bought this property. We hired a builder that had built for my dad before. And by the way, my dad was the first one to pour concrete pools. All the other farmers made them out of cement blocks and stuccoed them. And my dad was a very learned guy and he read and he made forms and he poured his own pools on Kendall and uh, where you could remove them and then form another pool. So uh, he was an innovator as well. We hired a builder to build our new farm because my dad was getting up there in age. And uh, we didn't realize that the guy from the year over the years had turned into alcoholic. He took a big deposit down, never saw the guy again. So by the time we could get another builder, we were only able to build four pools. And we had no building to move all the tanks and everything. So we sold as many of the fish off as we could. The rest of them stayed there and were bulldozed. And my dad lost all his strains and all the, the work he had done from 1950 to 1969. So we came over here, we slowly built some more pools built the building, but my dad never put in all the 10 gallon tanks and stuff like that before. But he still loved live bears and that's all we did. One day he noticed a Yucatan molly. Now the Yucatan molly is out of Mexico as well. It only grows about this big and it's beautiful because it lives better in an aquarium than the Latapina does. Uh, so he noticed a black one that had a little dot of gold on it. And he said, hmm, that's pretty interesting. So he put that in a couple of tanks that we had, took the babies, eventually took the, the prettiest male and female and kept breeding them and breeding them and breeding them and the same thing, taking the virgins, crossing them back to the best male. And eventually we came up with one that had quite a bit of gold on it. I named it the Gold Flake Molly. It's kind of like a cull now today off out of the other strains of mollies. Dad kept breeding them we wound up coming up with the gold dust molly, which was about half gold and half black. This is still out of the Yucatan. And then eventually, uh, we released that in 1972. Eventually, my dad came up with a solid gold molly. And I named it the 24 karat molly. And it's all over the world now. Unfortunately, a color change or a fin change, you could not get a patent on like you can on a new kind of rose. So once it's released, other people start breeding them, and of course the price goes down, down, down. And now it's all over the world. They're breeding them in Hong Kong. And of course now when you get an extra large one from Hong Kong, it's about three quarters of an inch versus what we used to sell at two inches. Then my dad says, hmm, let's, let's cross that Yucatan molly back to a sailfin molly. And uh, we did, and we wound up getting some very large fish. It's a picture of a show winner, because we used to enter the show for the tropical fish farmers. And if you notice, it's a big fish. It was, the fish was about this big. And, and we had, you know, you wouldn't, all the males wouldn't be that big, but a lot of them would be. And uh, we would win the show and have lots of, I got lots of trophies in the back. Uh, I do not have this strain anymore because 2011, I rented the farm out. My dad had passed away in 2000. And I rented the farm and the new renters uh, actually were cichlid breeders. And they bred cichlids and they got rid of all the live bearers slowly but surely. So all those strains were gone. I do have the gold dust molly uh, back though. Oh yeah, I want to talk about this little magazine. Uh, my dad being an artist and a fish lover decided he was going to publish a little magazine and he called it the Ichthyophile, which means fish lover's notebook. It's a four page little thing and basically it would go in a notebook and every couple months a new issue would come out. We would sell them to the pet stores and they would stamp their names on them or give them away or schools would get them as a donation. 
I think he used to sell them for 10 cents each. I've seen them on the internet for $10 each. And I burned hundreds of thousands of them because I had so many of them. Now I'm kicking myself. My dad bred the sword tail, and this is an indication. Most of the sword tails, the, the velvet swords, had white around the eye, around the pupil. And my dad bred it, bred it and got the cherry red color in them. And uh, also around the pupil is all red in there. It was red. That's a lost strain. When the plastic bag came out, it revolutionized the tropical fish business. Now understand, when I was a kid, there was no plastic. Even the refrigerators had metal liners in them. And those were our first fish ponds. My dad would go to the dump and we would dare tear, tear apart the old refrigerators, take the two halves, glue them together and tar them. And those were our first fish ponds. At that point, we would go to the canals and we would catch green sail and mollies by the thousands. These canals here were loaded with them, all the farming fields. And there was no junk in there, so you could pull a seine across there or scoop them up. You don't find them anymore because the canals are polluted. I hate to blame some of the farming, but some of it is the farmers. People dump stuff in, but the worst thing is people get these aggressive fish, like Oscars and different stuff, and decide, I don't want them anymore, and they throw them in the canals, and they eat everything. But imagine, I'm four to six, four to four, six, eight years old, out going out in these canals with my dad and my uncle and my dad would be saning these canals, catching these fish by the thousands. No plastic bags, no oxygen. We had these metal, they looked like milk cans, but they squatted down about this high, and they tapered at the top to an opening, and they were about this big around with two handles, and you imagine carrying those things with water, and, and, and you couldn't keep fish very long because you had no system of oxygenation. So when the plastic bag came out, man, that was like gold. We could take an oxygen tank, squeeze the oxygen, rubber band it, and we could catch thousands of these things and transport them. Dean's just getting bathroom material here. It's very interesting though. It is pretty cool. Yeah, really, really someone cool. would do this. Some of the size on these. That's like an unbelievable size. Yeah, that's gotta be like five inches. Yeah, and that gold one that I showed you the picture of over there, I had a whole strain of them. I probably had 50 or 60 of them wow. that big. That's how big it is. Wow. These are awesome. Legit. Like that thing actually makes yes. sense now. I, I, I haven't seen those since I've probably been like 15 yeah. or 16 years old. Just look at the size of the net pot compared yeah. to him. Because you, know? you see it all the time when you know people are like, I used to get mollies this big, and like now you see it in the flesh, it's, it's bigger than that even. That's insane. How big these tiger lotuses are, or is it aquarium lily? So this is the waterways for Summerland. And if you look down, there's fish. You can see fish. But if you look closer, Malaysian trumpet snails. Oh, that's Texas parrot. Yeah. I should show that to Josh. It's gorgeous. That's amazing. It's the first time he's been photographed. Mm -mm. He's, he's more like the green one, you yeah. know? But I'll show you the white ones that they're coming out of. You see a female white one right there. But I've got a pool over here. It's probably the last. I had thousands of these growing next door. I used to wholesale them to pet supermarket. So these are the vats right here. But on the other end, there's little tiny. See the red ones right there? 